Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Space Place Canada's second 2023 event, Sky Cultures and Knowledges, Exploring the World's Asterisms. My name is Kirsten Vanstone, and I'm a director with Space Place Canada, and I'll be your host for this evening. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Julie Tomei and Victoria Patterson, who are producing behind the scenes, monitoring your questions and comments on YouTube and making sure that everything runs smoothly. I am joining you today from the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the First of the Credit First Nation. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. You may be joining us from another part of Canada or even beyond, and I encourage you to learn more about the history of the land and the peoples in your area. We recognize the significance of these lands to Indigenous peoples, past and present, and as we engage in astronomy here, we respect, learn from, and honor the deep relationship between Indigenous peoples, the sky, and the earth. And I would like to thank the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada for partnering with us on this event, and particularly to the Toronto Centre of the RESC, where I am a member, for this thoughtful land acknowledgement. Now, some of you may have been following a thing in the sky over the last little while. It's a conjunction between Venus and Jupiter in the west after sunset. This is a photo from outside my home that I took, just holding my phone up to the sky. And if you looked up and wondered at them, even if you thought maybe they were two airplanes, you might just be interested in what Space Place Canada is doing. We are a Toronto-based nonprofit working to realize a dream of mine, and that is to bring a large planetarium back to Toronto. We want to bring a physical and virtual place for people to explore and learn about the wonders of space and to tell the stories of research in astronomy, aerospace, engineering, earth sciences, and of course, arts and math. Furthermore, a public planetarium will be an ecosystem for our education, academia, science, and civic leaders collaborating to create future jobs. Space Place Canada has more than 10,000 supporters worldwide, mainly through social media and an active events program. This is one of them tonight. A recent Nanos poll showed that Ontarians recognize the need for Space Place Canada and its contributions to education, tourism, and research. We would like to thank our sponsors for their generous support of our organization. And you can help too. With a donation of $20 and your snail mail address, we can send you our unique planetarium music card, which enables you to download the music from the McLaughlin Planetarium, which unfortunately closed back in 1995. If you remember, some of that music is really good. We're really, really excited to have this. It's nice to listen to. With a donation of $100 or more and your snail mail address, Anywhere in North America, we will send you a copy of An Earthling's Guide to Outer Space by one of our supporters, Bob McDonald, who is known from the CBC radio program, Quarks and Quarks. Now, I am particularly excited by tonight's events. I love sky stories. I love how they describe the world and are told in a way to be easily remembered and passed down from generation to generation. In my own life, I have memories of sitting by a lake in Halliburton, Ontario, spotting constellations with my uncle, and then spotting those same stars with my own kids and telling them stories. One that comes to mind is the Greek myth of Perseus and Andromeda, complete with Medusa's blinking eye, the variable star, Algol. This made a great, if slightly scary, bedtime tale that they still talk about. Stories, particularly funny or maybe even slightly bloody ones, also always help to keep the attention of a fidgety planetarium crowd and will help keep a crowd following along as you trace the sometimes hard to imagine dot to dots of constellations. Storytelling about the sky may appear as just something that we do for fun, but there is, in fact, a great depth to these tales and their accompanying sky figures. Science and culture weaves through them as a way to describe what is happening in nature and even helps illuminate a complete cosmology. That is the real power of these stories. They're not just simple bedtime fun. They have deep roots in the traditional ways of knowing, including sophisticated descriptions of the universe. And that's what we're going to be exploring tonight. I think it's a fascinating idea, and I'm really excited by the guests that our program team have lined up. Who are here tonight? I have Carrie Berglund, who's the Director of Education for Digitalis, a leading maker of planetarium products and educational software. Dr. Shandon Pete, Assistant Professor at the University of British Columbia, and member of the Bitterroot Band of the Salish in Montana, and Diné from the Beshpato Valley in Arizona. 
Dr. Pete is a hydrogeologist with an interest in indigenous research methodologies, and in particular, what we're talking about tonight is indigenous astronomy. And then Charles Ennis, president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, who was an originator, this thing called the World Asterisms Project, which he will tell us more about. Each speaker will take 10 to 15 minutes to discuss their topic, followed by a discussion, including questions from you. As our panelists present, if something occurs to you that you'd like to find out more about, please log into YouTube and put a comment in the YouTube chat. We'll be monitoring that. Or you can actually tag us on Twitter, if you like, at Space Place CDA. We're going to start tonight with uh, Carrie Berglund. So I would like to turn over the microphone, turn off my screen share, and invite you to the room, Carrie. All right, thank you, Kirsten. And I'm gonna share my screen before I do anything else. Let me make this full screen. So my name is indeed Carrie Berglund and I am the Director of Education at Digitalis Education Solutions. Um, a little bit about me, the reason why I am here I believe at least, is that I am responsible for contributing several of the sky cultures to the Stellarium project. Many of you are probably familiar with Stellarium. It's an open source astronomy program. Uh, the URL is right there if you've never heard of it before, stellarium.org. Uh, we don't actually contribute to Stellarium anymore. We were going more dome-based education. They were going more desktop education, um, but I still am a big believer in that project. It's, it's a wonderful piece of software. I have been teaching in planetarium for over 25 years. I got my start in a star lab traveling around Washington State for Seattle Specific Science Center, and I also oversaw the Willard Smith Planetarium there. And last but not least, I am the founder of and chief agitator for the Live Interactive Planetarium Symposium, which focuses on helping people become better teachers, interacting with their audiences, um, ways to improve their programs. Uh, so rather than just pressing play for a passive movie presentation, actually engaging the audience in a conversation. Uh, if you're curious about LIPS, that's our shorthand for it, uh, feel free to contact me anytime. And so what I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm actually glad that I'm going first because what I want to talk a little bit about first is why we use storytelling. Uh, and then I want to share some ideas and some information about how to use multicultural constellation stories, some advice that I have, have um, been told over the years or some tips that I have picked up. And then I'm going to share a few stories around from around the world, give you a taste of what those um, different cultures can tell us. And then last but not least, and this part will probably be pretty rushed, I will share a few of my favorite resources with you. So storytelling in general, why do we use it? Um, it's because it's universal. All cultures all over the world have always told stories. It's a key component of our history. It actually predates writing. It's a, it's a major way of passing information down from person to person. Uh, stories can be used to educate as well as entertain. And if you think of the stories from your youth, they often have a, a moral to them. This is something you should do. This is something you should not do. So there's that educational aspect. Um, to get more specific to the sky, stories make constellations more meaningful and therefore more memorable. Constellations have some very practical uh, reasons for being made for navigation, for example. And if you can't remember exactly which stars are in each constellation, it's not going to be that helpful for you. So the story can give you an anchor and help you remember um, that picture better. And then kind of the segue into the next bit is the stories provide a glimpse into different cultures. The pictures that people imagined and the stories that they told about those pictures in the sky can tell you something about what is important for that culture. So why tell multicultural stories? Um, I do a lot of conferences for Digitalis and I talk to lots of different types of people. And when I first started doing this, I was surprised at how many people did not realize that different cultures imagine different pictures in the sky. Uh, the Greek and Roman constellations are so prevalent that a lot of people think those are the only ones. And I think it's, it's um, eye-opening to present those different interpretations to people. Uh, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but constellations reflect the values of their culture and an interesting way to learn about what's important to those people. And last, but not least, sharing stories from around the world supports inclusivity and diversity efforts. Um, present a big picture, expand your audience's minds. 
some ideas for how to use multicultural stories. Um, know a little bit about the culture whose stories you're telling. Do some background research. If I was going to do an entire program on Chinese constellations, for example, I would not only learn the Chinese legends, I would also learn a little bit about China itself, its history, why those constellations were made. Um, just get to know the culture before you start talking about it. There are constraints associated with stories. Um, some stories are considered appropriate only for certain times of year. Dr. Pete can probably talk more about that sort of thing, but respect those constraints. If a story is not supposed to be told in July, don't tell that story in July. Uh, when possible, you might have a member of a culture tell the story for you. In this day and age, it's easy to find a recording, whether it's uh, just an audio recording or even with a video. Um, pull in a recording if you can't find a local live storyteller. This one's pretty obvious. Don't embellish or exaggerate. The story is what the story is. Um, it's just another way of being respectful and culturally sensitive. Uh, language and vocabulary matter. Don't diminish a story by saying uh, it's just a story. Um, and then last but not least, again, is embrace differences between your own culture and the culture whose stories you're telling. That's part of the fun of it. Uh, one of the reasons you're telling these stories is likely because you want to learn about other cultures. So embrace those differences, look into them. And now, Great, just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything in the chat. So now I'm gonna share a few stories with you. Um, and I figured this is a good time of the year to be looking at Orion so we could focus on him. We'll start with the Greek and Roman, um, the little picture there from, uh, actually from Stellarium and now from our Nightshade Planetarium software. You probably know a little bit about Orion. He's a popular telescope target because there's so many cool things to look at near him. He's a hunter. He has the two dogs that follow him across the sky, Canis Major and Canis Minor. They're not here in this picture. Uh, if you know very many stories about him, you know he's not a nice fellow. He, um, yeah, he's kind of a jerk. And the story that I'm going to tell will, will allude to that. And then an interesting thing is that many stories make reference to the constellation Scorpius, the scorpion, um, because Orion and Scorpius are not in the sky at the same time. There's stories about why those two very recognizable constellations do not coexist in the sky. And so there are a lot of different Greek and Roman stories about Orion, but I'm choosing to tell you this one. So Orion was the son of a poor shepherd called Hyraeus. One day, Zeus, Hermes, and Poseidon stopped by Hyraeus's house. Hyraeus was so generous with his guests that he killed the only, only animal he had, an ox. Hyraeus was not aware that his guests were gods. The gods wanted to reward his generosity by granting him a wish. Hyraeus's biggest desire was to have a child. The gods told him to bury the hide of the ox he had sacrificed to them and then to pee on it. After nine months, a boy was born in that place. The child became a very handsome and strong man. We know him as Orion. Orion was such a good hunter that he was hired by the king Anopion to kill the ferocious beasts that were terrifying the inhabitants of the island Chios. Happy for his success, Orion said he would kill all the wild animals on the earth. But the earth goddess Gaia, who was the mother of all animals, was not pleased with Orion's intentions. Gaia sent an enormous scorpion on Orion. Orion soon realized that his strength and sword were useless against the scorpion. Orion tried to escape, but the scorpion stung him to death. Gaia placed the scorpion in the sky as a constellation, as a reminder to be kind to animals and to respect the environment. He also placed Orion in the stars in front of the scorpion so that he is being chased forever for not respecting the animals and the environment. So that's a great example of a story that has um, an educational aspect to it, a, a do this, don't do this, don't, don't do that sort of fail to it. All right, the next story I wanted to share is from the Navajo. Uh, it's a different way to connect the stars, uh, to create first slim one. A um, couple of fast facts there. This constellation is associated with agriculture. First slim one is seen as a protector and is also associated with Scorpius. 
And I should mention that the first slim one is also sometimes referred to as first slender one. The first slim one is a young man in the prime of his life. He carries a bow and arrow and is a warrior protecting his people. Like Dilyehe, which is the Navajo name for the Pleiades, this constellation is related to planting and is seen every season except for part of the summer. First slim one is often spoken of as the son-in-law to first big one, which includes part of the constellation of Scorpius. In accordance with Navajo tradition of mothers-in-law and sons-in-law not meeting or speaking, first big one and first slim one are never seen in the sky at the same time. The Navajo used first slim one to plan their planting and harvesting. When first slim one set at dusk, it was time to plant crops. And when first slim one rose at dusk, it was time to harvest. Because of this association with agriculture, first slim one is often pictured with a digging stick nearby so that he can make holes to plant seeds. And that's what that stick is in front of first slim one in this drawing, it's a digging stick or digging holes in the ground. And then the last uh, culture I wanted to share a story from is Hindu. So one more interpretation of those stars. Uh, this is Kalparash, which is sometimes split into two words. You'll see in that first bullet point, it literally means time man. There are several different interpretations of this. Um, one of them is that Kalparash represents the god Vishnu, who was the preserver and protector of the universe. Sometimes this group of stars is called Skanda, as in the story that I'm about to share with you. This one's very dramatic. So long ago, there was a wicked demon named Parakasura. When he was born, the whole earth trembled. Storms rose, mountains shook, and wild animals started running in fear. He grew up to be a very powerful and formidable person and started wreaking havoc everywhere he went. His ultimate dream, however, was to conquer the heavens. To do this, Tarakasura needed to be invincible and immortal. He began his penance by forsaking food and water, and he stood on the thumb of his foot for a thousand years. Finally, Lord Brahma appeared before him and asked him for his request. When Tarakasura asked for immortality, Brahma said, you cannot ask for the impossible. Anyone born must also die. Tarakasura, after a lot of contemplation said, then grant me the wish that if I must die, my death should happen at the hands of a seven-year-old child. Tarakasura thought he was pretty clever. He thought that he had fooled Lord Rama with this request. After his, his request was granted, Tarakasura went on a rampage. He attacked the heaven and defeated all the divas, the celestial beings associated with various aspects of the cosmos. Many gods were taken prisoners. A few gods managed to escape and they beseeched Lord Brahma to save them. Lord Brahma said, only the son of Lord Shiva can slay Tarakasura, but Shiva is a recluse and lives a solitary life on Mount Kailasa. After the death of, of Sati, he was overwhelmed with grief and entered into deep meditation. If you can get Parvati, the beautiful daughter of Himalaya, to marry Shiva, all your problems will be over. Well, breaking the meditation of Shiva was not an easy task. The gods hatched plans for Parvati to meet Lord Shiva, and asked, after a lot of ardent attempts, she finally managed to win his heart with the help of Kamadeva, who is like the Indian Cupid. At last, Shiva and Parvati got married, and Skanda, also known as Kalparash, as we have him in our picture here, was born. Both Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu trained Skanda in the art of warfare. By the time he was seven, Skanda had mastered all the divine weapons, especially the Supreme Spear. It was now time for Skanda to win heaven back from the grasp of the invincible Parakasura. Skanda led the army of gods, and after a fierce battle, he shoved his celestial spear into the heart of Parakasura. This impossible feat made Skanda a legend and literally earned him a place among the stars where we still see him today. There. Well, hopefully you hopefully you enjoyed those stories. Uh, I wanted to share, I know this is probably not the easiest way to see them, but um, some of my favorite books for researching constellations of different cultures. There's a lot here. Um, 
Uh, the one that if you can only afford one of these, I would say go for the one at the bottom right beyond the blue horizon that has a fantastic uh, bibliography in it. It's probably 20 pages long, if not longer, of different books that you can use to um, find out more about astronomy of different cultures. And then uh, a few online resources. I mentioned Stellarium.org at the beginning, that free open source planetarium software. The second one is from Berkeley multicultural constellations. And then the last one has an almost impossible <laughs> one to write down without making a mistake, but it's from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific who have a lot of fantastic resources in general. Um, and if you go to their astrosociety.org website, you'll be able to find the multicultural constellations quite easily. That's how I found it in the first place. And with that said, I believe I'm out of time. So there's my email address if you wanna write directly to me. Um, Maybe ask me about the Live Interactive Planetarium Symposium uh, or any other question that's right there. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Kirsten. Thank you very Thank much, you. Carrie. I would like to say that uh, Space Place Canada will put your resources on our website if that would be acceptable to you. So if you want to see them all, spaceplacecanada.ca. Uh, navigate to this event and we'll have a listing there in a day or two. It may take a little while. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Shandon Pete, who's going to tell us a little bit about his uh, learnings about some Salish astronomy, I believe. Dr. Pete. All right, great. Can you hear me okay? I'm assuming you can. All right. So what I'm going to do here is do a screen share, make sure that's working correctly. Everyone can see that okay? All right, great. So uh, yeah, you know, I've been uh, diving into um, the, the study of astronomy for quite some time since I was a youth, I suppose, more informally. And I suppose even this research I'm doing is very informal, <clears throat> but it's really driven by my own curiosity about uh, what we learn in uh, the informal education. So from the books, from our uh, journey through public education, and even in um, through um, post-secondary. But um, I was always curious about my own traditions and how those align with or maybe or don't align with what is uh, more commonly known in, uh, in the mainstream. And in particular, I want to talk about the bear. And everybody knows the bear, but um, you might not know it from the Salish tradition. So if you look at this map here, this is uh, the little red dot is where I'm from, where I grew up. It's the home of the the easternmost band of Salish speaking folks and then the state the Salish speaking folk folks spread all the way across into the coast uh, comprising much of the uh, proportion of the Pacific Northwest so these are all Salish speaking folks that generally share a very similar oral tradition and so that's some sort of where um, a lot of my research comes from is uh, examining my neighbors stories chatting with folks about what they know and what we don't know and trying to fill in those gaps uh, so that the next generation of curious folks will have a bit more knowledge to uh, build on. So again, like the bear. So this is the one. And if you look at this picture, of course, you're going to draw uh, uh, probably a very immediate conclusion about what you're seeing here. And generally, when I'm speaking to an audience, I get some q a right up front people can say oh yeah that's the that's the big dipper but i don't have nobody it's like i'm talking to my myself <laughs> i'm talking to a screen feels kind of odd but anyway we're going to get through this so this here is uh, of course um what's commonly referred to as the big dipper and um if you know anything about the big dipper you probably also know it as ursa major and um that draws a very clear picture of what ursa major is and if you look in uh, many textbooks and uh, even online resources, you'll find the standard picture of the bear. In this case, I think um, the grizzly bear. But there's something odd about this that I've always was I was always curious about, and maybe you had the same curiosity. Um, but the bear doesn't look like any bear that I've ever seen. 
Now I haven't seen many bears in my life in the wild. I've seen a number, but on the on pictures and in uh, uh, documentaries, you see a great deal of bears, especially the uh, grizzly bear. And you know by looking at this picture and reflecting back on what you see, it doesn't, something doesn't line up. And in particular, it's the tail. The tail is this elongated uh, appendage coming off of the grizzly bear. That's that's not founded in reality. If you look at a grizzly bear today, yeah, it doesn't have this long tail. So this was a source of great curiosity for myself about, about that particular tradition and where it came from. But if you if you also are a, a novice or an expert in in these kind of matters, you'll also know that this grouping of stars is very similar, and you might not be able to pick it out as you look at the screen now. But upon further inspection, you'll realize that oh yeah, that's the uh, the Little Dipper, and that's also a bear. By golly, and wouldn't you know, this bear also has a long tail. This is what's been fed to us for many years, all my life. I've known this uh, as the Little Dipper and also associated with the name Ursa Major or Ursa Minor. And it has a long tail. And I don't, I didn't get that. I thought this is not something that I'm familiar with. So this leads me down a journey of understanding uh, the traditions of my own people. So um, I'll sort of walk down the path, my pathway of thought as I'm thinking about these things and lead you down the road to some uh, kind of a dilemma I'm experiencing. And hopefully that uh, folks listening in, well, maybe they'll have some idea or maybe a solution to this dilemma. But this is a common, sort of a common approach that uh, I think all of humanity has, at, has had at one point in time where we encounter a strange phenomenon and we tried to explore it. And then we passed the word along to see if we're talking crazy or maybe we actually uh, onto something. So hopefully at the end of this, you'll say one of the two. You say, you're onto something. Or you say, man, this guy is nuts. And you probably won't email me if that's the case. You're like, I don't want to hurt his feelings and tell him he's, he's going way off. But I don't know. We'll see. But email me anyway if that's the case. I want to know. I want to get some data from the audience. All right. So let's walk down the road of the Salish understanding of these two particular uh, constellations. So again, this is drawing from many different tribal groups in the Salish speaking territories. Uh, but first, you know, I, I wanted to understand more about the, the tradition of Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. So I come to find out, and this is just very recent, I've been diving into the archives to try to figure out where this tradition come from of the long, of the long elongated tail of these two uh, constellations. And as far back as um, 138, that's kind of odd to hear the, a year as 138. <laughs> We're used to hearing it as 2000, whatever, or 19, whatever. But yeah, as far back as that, it's been recorded as having a, a tail of some sort. So um, this was from, uh, like I said, 100, somewhere between 138 and 161, I think they say AD, I think. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it was recorded then as having a tail a long tail. And when things started to get illustrated, so ideas started to become uh, printed in book as an illustration, we see in uh, 1482, we see the constellation of uh, the Big and Little Dipper or Ursa Major Minor, depicted as bears and also with elongated tails. Curious, very curious. And this pattern continues forth in 1524, uh, elongated tails in these two constellations. Strange. So in our tradition, where I come from, the Salish folks, um, there was not a lot of um, information documented about the constellations. It, I, I remember as being a young man and asking around about particular things, and a lot of people didn't know. It was sort of something that was lost in time through the through the various phases of boarding school and government policies that sort of stripped a lot of our understandings and knowledge away from us through those actions that we lost a lot of this knowledge. But luckily, there's some folks that do remember. And in particular, there was a, a wave of anthropologists and even um, religious folks, so priests that had come through 
uh, from the mid 1800s all the way up to probably about the, the mid 1900s, this wave of folks just gathering information and knowledge about our people. So those people at that time, my ancestors had a, a distinct knowledge of these things. So some of these things got recorded. And this is sort of where I started. So there's this word, it's called spell And in 1930, uh, anthropologist by the last name of Schaefer recorded some details about these, uh, this word, which translates to seven stars. And in particular, he said the day uh, could not arrive until this finished its journey across the sky, indicating that, yeah, it was seen uh, all day or, or during every time of the season. And then um, we all know that uh, the dippers, both big and little, have seven stars. So another word that was uh, uh, located was recorded in the early 1800s by a, one of the Jesuit priests that's made its way to Montana. And this word was called the Simchait Janoskit, and that was recorded as the grizzly bear in the sky, or that's the translation of the word. And in uh, this, this uh, priest dictionary, he recorded it as the polar star. So we have quite a, a dilemma here. We have two names, um, both indicating that it could belong to two different constellations. So then I branch out amongst my uh, neighboring uh, tribal people to figure out maybe if we can uh, come to an, a conclusion about what these stars might be. So there's a number of stories. There's a number of uh, oral traditions that um, are somewhat dis that had been somewhat disconnected from the constellations. But at, through some of my uh, interrogations, I found that some of these um, some of these uh, constellations are actually attached to some of these uh, stories. So this is what I've found so far. There's uh, our neighbors to the west, the Shitsawi, the Coeur d'Alene. They have a very particular story about a grizzly bear that has three brother-in-laws. They don't like him much. They want to wipe him out. They want to kill him. So they, they hunt him down and shoot him. But before they, they do, they're all turned into stars. And it was recorded um, that the four stars forming the cup of the feet or forming the cup are the feet of the grizzly and the three stars of the handle are the brother-in-laws. Okay. That gives me a little more detail, a little more information. Further, another uh, Salish-speaking tribe to the north, up, up across the border into Canada, tell a very similar story about the grizzly bear having uh, black bears for brothers in this particular story. And uh, in this case, um, again, they don't like him and they want to hunt him down. Uh, in this case, there was, I think, I believe four brothers. One of them turned themselves into a dog and they're all trying to chase this grizzly bear down to kill him. Uh, before they could, they were turned into stars. And in particular, what was recorded about these ones is that the, the three stars of the handle are the hunters. Aligns fairly well with the previous. And then finally, let's see if I can get my, uh, I'm having a little issue with, uh, with my PowerPoint advancing. We'll get it. Okay. So there's a story also among my people, the Salish people, which is somewhat disjointed, but somewhat aligned. It's again, the story of four, four wolf brothers this time. They're not bears. And they have a, um, a grizzly bear that they're trying to kill. And some of the deep, this is a very long story, but in the end, these bears are trying to hunt down the grizzly. The youngest one kills the grizzly, wears the grizzly bear's hide, tries to catch up to his brothers. They think that he's the grizzly, and then they try to kill him. And I think, it doesn't say in the story, but I think this may be aligned to the other two. Okay, so this is the dilemma. We've got a couple stories then that say, well, there's, there's a certain arrangement of these stars that are related to the grizzly bear um, being the cup of the Big Dipper, where the cup is actually the paws of the bear, and then the stars behind it are the hunters in a particular order. And again, this could also align with, since the name of the polar star is Simchait Janoskit, it could also align with the Little Dipper. Hard to say, though. So my question then is, is there some sort of interpretation error from the anthropologist? I'm curious if the anthropologist listening to the informant was just making this assumption that these stories were about what was familiar to them, which is Ursa Major and Minor. I don't know. I wasn't there, and there's not a lot of detail that says that they're interpreting this or this is the actual thing that the informant was saying. 
So that leaves quite the dilemma. And, um, but the most curious, I think an important point in this whole story was really examining what these stories are saying and that it says the cup is the footprint of the bear. So that means that we're looking down on the bear. As we look up, we're looking down upon the bear. And then the three dots or the three stars behind it are, again, we're looking down upon these um, black bears or these hunters. Now, this aligns very well with the traditions of our people in which we have a belief that uh, the stars, that as we look up, is a reflection of what's going on down below us or was at one time a reflection of that. So we can look at the other constellations and say, well, that pattern also fits very well with um, the Little Dipper, including the sort of minor stars that are sitting around by the middle of the handle of the both of the stars. So what is the true story? I don't know. But this leads to um, a very interesting uh, dilemma. And um, let's see, we'll ignore that because I don't want to get too wordy here, but I'm taking up a lot of time. There's another tradition, and this one's this one comes from the Salish again, which really reverses the script a bit, in which the polar star is actually the grizzly, and then the two stars of the handle are the black bear, and then the one star within the cup of the of the little dipper is another black bear with his brother, the dog. Now, this seems to align well with the name of the star, which is the Samhaich Anoskit as the polar star. Seems to match up quite a bit. But again, I think the most interesting part of this question is the perspective in which we see the night sky. Traditionally, we're accustomed to seeing the night sky. Actually, I'm going to skip this because this is something totally different. And maybe if I get to it, I'll go back to it. We'll see, though. We're accustomed to seeing the night sky as. Um, as, as if it was illustrated in a book. Uh, or, or we're accustomed to seeing, uh, I guess, the description of constellations illustrated in a book. So from the early 1400s, uh, the first sort of uh, illustrations of the constellations began to be put into print and consumable by the, by the general public. So I'm wondering if this, um, there's been a misconception of all these stories and that we're not actually looking up into the sky as if it was a storybook, but we're actually looking down on another world, sort of like our traditions are here among the Salish. But we've also been, I, don't, I wouldn't say infected by this, but our interpretation has also been, uh, um, has also intersected this reality in which we also have committed some of our stories to books. And in these books, we've often sanitized a lot of these stories because they're meant for school-age children. So um, we're, we also have done a degree of changing of our own stories. So this is a very interesting problem and a very interesting dilemma um, that I like to explore and try to come to the truth of what, uh, what, what our ancestors really seen. And this was, I, I'll skip this one too, because I've I'm, I'm already gone over 16 minutes and I don't want to take too much time. But this is just a description of how we see the world, the world as a, the sky as the upside down world or the world above us. So we're always looking down upon it. And that was once a tradition among other uh, groups too across the world is that we've seen the, the, the heavens as a reflection of the earth. So that's, um, that's just, that's what I got for now. I can, I, I have another interesting dilemma I was going to show you, but it would take much, much more time, probably at least 10 more minutes. I don't want to do that. I want to give more time. So that's all I got for now. I hopefully that spawned some questions and I'm welcome to hear those at the end. All righty. Thank you so much, and uh, I think you could have kept going. Honestly, it was really interesting. Um, I've always wondered about the the bear tale. There's lots of little stories, so maybe we can come back to that in the questions. And that's just to remind everybody who's watching, please uh, put your questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, Julie will be monitoring that and passing them along. Uh, all right, so now we welcome Charles Ennis, who is the president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Hello, Charles. Hello. You're going to be here to tell us about your little project that grew. My little project. Yes, okay. <laughs> Welcome. Let's share screen. All right. Slideshow from the beginning. And I want to welcome everybody from wherever you're from in, in the world. And I'd like to gratefully acknowledge that I'm coming to you uh, where I observe and live on the unceded lands of the Seashell First Nation. 
which is one of those Salish people you just heard about. And this is about the Inclusivity and Diversity Committee of the RESC creating a World Asterisms Project back in June of 2021. And we used this as a reconciliation project using the two eyes seeing approach created by Mi'kmaq Elder Albert Marshall in 2004, which allows our astronomers and their knowledge keepers to share knowledge and uh, get a greater understanding. When I say asterism in this project, I mean a star or a group of stars that have been identified and named. There are asterisms out there that aren't. And how many different cultures have we dealt with so far? 572. How many asterisms so far? 11,579, including 432 names in the Milky Way. And how many of those are telescopic? 1,489 so far. We've also added solar system objects. Now, these aren't asterisms, but they form part of the stories that are involved with these asterisms. So we think this is important. So the grand total takes us over 13,000. And as Dr. Pete was just saying, this is about the sky mirroring the Earth. This is a, a beautiful picture from a Mi'kma artist, Gerald Glode. And you can see it's about perspectives. It's about ancient science, and I'll get to that. And it's about inspiration, this project. Now, there are 7,000 world languages. In your child's lifetime, half will probably disappear. And you're probably saying, well, OK, thank you. And another language is still thank you. What's the big deal? Cultures are foundations of knowledge. And key concepts and ways of seeing the world will disappear with those languages. So this relates to the difficulty of translating words accurately into other languages. My favorite example is this word right here. It's Benwa, which is a Mari uh, Iwi word. And it means land, country, ground, terrain, and placenta. Let that sink in for a sec. Basically, what we're saying here, the land that gives me birth, the land that nourishes me. And the Maori were great navigators. Navigation forms a huge part of their culture. They were great navigators when my ancestors were still afraid to leave the coastlines because they thought the world was flat. Here's the southern sky as the international uh, Astronomical Union has defined it. Here's a Mari sky. And you see everything on this sky is navigational, everything. It's about science. This is an ancient Australian sky. The Kokatha saw the Pleiades as a Ugaria, which is a group of young women, and their elder sister, Kambaguda, is the Hyades. And Nairuna is a hunter who is trying to get to those younger sisters. Kambaguda has deployed her dingo puppies to guard them. And every so often he gets angry and one of his stars, that'll be Betelgeuse, which is a variable down here, glows brighter, which means he's about to throw magic at them. But what happens is Aldebaran starts to glow, which means she's kicking it back. So they recognized variable stars thousands of years ago. These are weather prediction systems. This is an Inuit sky. And you can see down here a star called Flickering, which is Sirius which is always very close to the horizon where they are. And if it's flickering, it means that there is turbulence in the atmosphere and there are winds coming. It's a navigation system. This is Ka'iwakamo, which is the boneback lizard in Hawaiian culture. There's their zenith star. And they have two lines here on either end of this asterism, which indicate north-south. And they do that because it could be rising or setting, so you only see part of the constellation. Another thing from Hawaiian skies, this is another one of their navigational asterisms, the Kite of Koala, which is named after one of their ancestors. And every single one of those four stars in the corners are also named for ancestors. And this is something you see world over. It's a divination system. This is an interesting chart from the uh, Renaissance that show, compares Chinese, Vedic, and Greek skies and it was for the purposes of figuring out how these two, how these various different astrological systems work. The skies are a place where people put their deities, their honored ones, their heroes. We've seen examples already from the other two presenters. This is the great one, the god Ea from Babylonian skies. And it was also a calendar. Um, you didn't have a calendar to hang on the wall. You looked up at the sky and you told what time of day it was or what season it was from the yeah. things that you saw in the sky up above. Chinese skies are 
full of asterism. Chinese Zing Wans is over 300. They vary over different eras. But there is a huge number uh, of things up there. But then if you go way up north, the people up there have one asterism in the sky. And it's the entire sky, Yadi, the traveler. Now, we're used to stick figures. They're very often portrayed that way when we're looking at star maps. But this isn't just about stick figures. Because if you are in Africa, you have single star asterisms where every star is a character in the story. So, for example, this star, Aldebaran, in Taurus is a great hunter or a sky god, depending on the tribe. And his wives are over here. And they're saying, go out there and hunt. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And there are three animals over here, which could be zebra, or they could be tapers. There's all kinds of different variations. He shoots an arrow, but it falls short. And he's embarrassed because he can't go after it. Why? Because Beetlejuice is a lion waiting in ambush. If you are in the southern hemisphere, you are looking up at the sky into the galaxy. If you're in the northern hemisphere, you're looking out. When you're looking into the galaxy, you see all of these dust clouds. And these are used in the southern hemisphere all over the place as asterisms. This is an Inca sky. And here you see their entire series of constellations is all dust clouds except for two stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri. And all over the world in the southern hemisphere, this is either an emu or rhea or an ostrich in the sky. Now, this has to do with telescopic asterisms too, because people for centuries have been looking at the sky, seeing clusters like this one here, NGC 2301, and saying, gee, that looks like. And it was originally called Copeland's Golden Worm for this guy that you see in the corner here, Ralph Copeland, who was a, an English astronomer. Then it became known as the bird cluster, does resemble a bird, but then along came fans of this guy, and it became Hagrid's dragon. And so it's an ongoing process, and these asterisms acquire names one after another, depending on the culture that's looking at them. Now, if you're thinking, well, okay, we're going to try and go back to a time when everybody in that culture saw the same thing in the sky. Sorry, didn't ever happen. If you look at Stellarium, you'll see there's four different versions of just the Western sky there. If you go back to Ptolemy's 48 constellations, and we take this one right here, the rain holder, Aniochus, which became later when it was Latinized, Ariga, charioteer. Back in his day, he knew this was a very popular sport involving gambling and factions and huge events, and everybody had an opinion. And that constellation was named for every single famous charioteer, deity associated with chariots, people who invented chariots, bigas, quadrigas, harness, whatever. So, and he knew this. So basically what you're saying is all these different areas had different ideas. And this is quite common. Like you're looking at this piece of the world right here. These people over here have a certain bunch of stars in the sky, which is associated with a certain deity or a certain story. And just a few miles down the road, same stars, different story, or same story, different stars, quite common. So there is a lot of variation and it has to do with your perspective. And the perspective here, basically, is um, from the northern and southern hemisphere, you're looking at Orion here. You can see that it is sort of like an upright figure. But if you're in equatorial regions, it looks like this. And what they typically describe is a plow or a spring trap for wild animals. We were looking at the Big Dipper a moment ago and talking about it being associated with bears, but it's been associated with a lot of other things over the years. I'm gonna show you an example here. I'm gonna take Leo, which is not the top of the hit parade in the asterism uh, world, but it is a, a, a very uh, common asterism up there, 358 different versions of it. And this is the way it's depicted on a modern star chart. Back in Babylonian days, it was this Urgulu demon, which was kind of a cross between a lion and some sort of winged creature. It was first mentioned by Aratus in his poem Phenomena. Uh, Ptolemy listed it as a lion, and it does appear in the Indera ceiling of uh, the temple in, in Egypt as a lion. But And there is what Ptolemy's lion looks like. But... That's what would lead us to believe, you know, in our modern skies, this is what it looks like viewed from the side. 
But here's a Chinese guy. And you see here we have a dragon. And that's where the constellation is. It's broken up into all kinds of different singla. The ancient Egyptians also depicted it as a knife or a sickle. The Romanians and the Basque people saw it as a horse. The Dakota, Lakota and Dakota saw it as a fireplace. There it is there. If you were an ancient Mayan astronomer, you were looking at a single star and a constellation to call death. And if you're Ojibwe or Anishinaabe, it's the great panther and curly tail right there. Ancient Romans called them Bacchus stars. They also called them the Basilica of the stars. They even called them the whole house of the stars. If you're in Australia and you're Wardaman, it's a dog. And if you're Barasana, it's a crayfish. But I want to show you something. And this is probably because uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Pete here, was, was interested in looking down. This is typically how the Arab people depicted the sky. And Al-Assad, their lion, was viewed as depicted from above. It's much larger. It involves parts of several different constellations. The main is their Manzil or lunar station Al-Zibra, and the forehead is their Manzil al God. So here you see the lion. And you see it goes all the way from Cancer at one end to Virgo at the other. And you've got the legs here. You've got the nostrils, you've got the eyes, which is one of the lunar stations. There's the forehead, there's the main star of weather change, which is a very important star for them, the bend, the back, and the tassel. And tassel actually, right there, is Malat 111, it's a, or Calendar 256, it's an open cluster. And it right at the very front, right in front of the nose, this is what they call either the nose hairs or the sneeze, and it's what we now call the uh, beehive cluster, Messier 44, which Ptolemy would have called the um, manger. Let's show you another one. This is Aldabaran, the follower. And when you look at the sky, you're looking here around uh, Taurus. Aldabaran is here. He's got his dogs. He's got a pen that you see all around there. And there, are the camels that he's in charge of. And what is he following? This. And this is the little abundant one. The, it's an ancient name. It's a female diminutive. It's clearly a term of endearment. There, we're not entirely sure exactly how it translates. It's that old. It's made up of several different constellations. And it is a woman viewed from above dancing, which, and it's really hard to find a picture of a woman dancing from above. Let me tell you, this is from National Geographic from a thing about Arab weddings. So here she is. You're looking at the top of her head. That's the Pleiades cluster. You have the henna tinted hand up here on the end of this beautiful arm. And you have the leprous hand on this arm. So there's the top of the head. There is that beautiful arm. And the hand attended hand, this is this W of Cassiopeia you see here. And that's where the hand attended hand is, if you're not entirely sure. And the wrist is the double cluster. That's a tattooed wrist. But if you go down, and you'll notice all around this part of the sky, there's all kinds of clusters and galaxies and stuff. But down below here, there's only one thing. And that's the ring on the finger, which is Messier 77, which is a galaxy. So basically, she's the balance between light and dark and good and evil and plenty and famine. And she's the tipping point. And her arms are embracing all the lucky stars that the Arabs have in the sky. So there were all kinds of other examples I can give you during the Renaissance period. It was quite common for astronomers to create constellations at a crazy rate to usually make their, their uh, patrons happy because they were royalty and they gave them money and they wanted to keep being astronomers for them. So they created asterisms all over the place. But then finally, in 1922, the International Astronomical Union said, we're trying to share information between different parts of the world and everyone's got different maps. We can't, we can't do this anymore. We gotta fix this. That is when we got the 88 constellations that we now have today. And that the ones in the Southern Hemisphere were not borrowed from the people of that part of the world. They were created by these scientists. And it's a picture of their time with all of the kind of 
machines and instruments that they would have had at that time. But actually, it's still going on. And the stars up there all have been named as well. And eventually, the International Astronomical Union realized that they'd have to standardize those two. And that was about the time that they were starting to discover exoplanets. And nobody wants to call their exoplanet a smaller case letter after a great big list of numbers and, and letters, which represents some star catalog somewhere. You want to give it an exciting name like Arrakis or something, right? So they created a working group on star names, and they started assigning names to these. They also assigned each country a star that had not been named and said, name it the exoplanet. And so we are still getting people naming these things. So if you want to check out this, there's the link. You can go to our website. It's a free download, all of these different things. And what we've got is a handbook listing all the asterisms by subject and describing them in detail. We have tables, both as PDF and Excel spreadsheets, so you can explore these in more detail. There's also a list, an appendix that shows you how many times each constellation is used all over the world. There's a Sky Cultures resource list, and that's part of that two-eyed seeing. We want the people whose story it is to tell you the story, and this is where you're going to find out who those people are and how to get a hold of them. There's a Milky Way names list, because that's a huge asterisk. And then there's this, that solar system handbook that I told you about, and a list that goes with that. Now, this is a living project. I told you how many asterisms there are. It's already out of date. That was the number from 7 o'clock this morning, and I've added to it already. This is what my inbox looks like, okay? This is a huge project and when we first started it people said do you realize how big this is and, I, and the short answer is no but when i found out it was let's do that so do you have an asterism you'd like to share maybe you've been at the eyepiece and you've seen something and it looked like something and you thought gee i'd like to to sort of record that yes share that with us we want to know and i'm going to leave it right there there's how you can contact us if you've got that sort of information and we'd be happy to answer any kind of questions you have but i think i made it inside of 20 minutes <laughs> 15 yeah. actually good well, very good well, all right <laughs> thank you charles um yeah. i think that's an amazing resource uh the more i learned about the world asterism project the more i think wow you know this thing is there anything else comparable to it in the world and I don't think there is. There, there was a whole lot of ethnoastronomers that jumped on this project right at the very start, saying it's about time somebody did this. Let's go. <laughs> and you know, the Australian team that's been working on their guys for twenty years shared their list. Same with the African, and on and on and on. And 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 you know, we we've been uh, we have a, a Google Drive where we share stuff if you're if you're actively involved in it. But yes, I mean, there is one thing I should have mentioned too, which is that, um, for example, those Hawaiian skies I showed you, they lost the skies through the same sort of corrosive colonial stuff that, that Dr. Pete was describing. And uh, they got uh, a, a replica canoe built so that they could learn how to sail again. And they've got a satellite navigator named Mal Pilo to come along and teach them how to use the stars. And he said, same stars, same stars. You may find some of those names because your culture is Polynesian, so is mine, and we have common names, and you know. But if you haven't got that name anymore, give it a new one. <laughs> and so the new name for Orion is the Cat's Cradle, because that's a very popular children's game with strings. And it does look like that, doesn't it? It does. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Charles. If I can ask our other speakers to to come back on camera if they're still here, uh, we have an opportunity now to just have a little discussion and uh, get the questions in from our viewers on YouTube who have been having a fairly active discussion. But I just wanted to, for those of you who are not necessarily as uh, well versed in astronomy as some of us may be, just to first off, uh, reinforce the difference between a constellation and an asterism. And I think you kind of did uh, end with that, Charles, but let's just let's just say we all know about the constellations and Carrie working in planetariums, you know that sometimes they bear no resemblance to what they're supposed to, right? Yeah, yeah, it's always a bit of a joke. Um, <laughs> so, so can somebody, uh, Charles, maybe just restate it. What is the difference between the two? Okay, they're all asterisms. 
Okay. Um, but some of them became official when the IAU made them official in 1922. Those are constellations. Actually, the term asterism predates constellation. Constellation didn't show up until about the 1400s. Okay. Uh, I know that Jeffrey Chaucer uh, wrote about it because he also wrote a uh, treatise on the astrolabe. So, um, but that's basically the difference. The official one is a constellation. Everything else is an asterism. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Carrie, can I just ask you, we've got some questions coming in, but since I'm hosting, I get to ask, what is, in your opinion, the worst sort of constellation to try to describe to somebody, say, and they always oh. go, that doesn't look anything like it's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, pain is minor, because yeah. it is just two stars <laughs> and a line. Yeah, it's and a hot somehow dog. we're supposed to imagine a little dog there. <laughs> right. Okay. Excellent. That would to mind right away. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll 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 agree with you on that one. Okay. We have a question in from Pam. Uh, would similar representations like birds for constellations have come up independently, or was there shared knowledge between the different cultures? And if they were independent, and I'm thinking bears is one that is you know pretty prevalent, but independent. Is there any theory as to why? If you talk to my Australian colleagues and, you, and they have ways of um, dating the stories, depending on where the stars were, because the stars move, of course, um, they have been able to show, and, and, and my Belarusian colleague, Dr. Uh, Avalon, has done the same. You can see how cultures living next to each other will borrow ideas or that there, there will be a migration of an idea, but at the same time, you can see that in Australia and in Africa and in other parts of the southern world, they have that emu, the rhea in South uh, America, the, the ostrich in Africa, and there isn't a connection there. So you see examples of both, I think. Excellent. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts on that? Well, I have, I think, a follow-up question for Charles. I, I would expect to see more... I guess, cross-pollination of ideas for uh, seeing cultures like the Polynesians. Is that, is that true? There, yeah, there is a lot of shared stuff um, there, but there also is a lot of um, local variation. Again, it depends on your perspective and it depends on your people and their history and who they are commemorating in the sky. And so, you know, if you tell a story to somebody and they whisper it in the next person's ear and it goes all the way around the circle and it comes back to you, it, it's changed, right? Yeah. So there's a little bit of that going on. You can see the similarities. This is one of the reasons we've listed all the things in this project by subject. So we want you to see the crossover between the different cultures. Um, you know, the bear thing that um, that that story uh, of of the hunters. You've got the bears hunting the bears in the Salish version, but it's wolves and other. First Nations um, versions, and it's it's actual men hunting in, in others. But they're both three stars, and uh, you know the Mi'kmaq version is Muin, the bear, and the seven hunters. So it goes all the way down into uh, Bootis, and they're birds that are mm -hmm. chasing. One of them's carrying a pot, you know. So there, are, <laughs> there you can see how it cross pollinates. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking that, and I was wondering, Shandon, if you had any thoughts about. What is the hatred for brother-in-laws? That's, <laughs> that's an interesting one. <laughs> but I think in that your... might be a that might be a universal uh, thing globally. <laughs> no, my brother-in-law's not share. watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm curious if you've seen that same kind of thing. If you're looking within a certain culture, you've got. But in in your case, you're looking at uh, stories that you're really questioning whether or not they've been matched up to the right things. Is that? Is that right? So it's a little too early to tell. Yeah, you know, um, th there seems to have been a lot of uh, pollution of ideas and thoughts. I wouldn't necessarily say pollution, but you know, like this crossover and exchange of ideas. You know, naturally, as as cultures uh, come together, you know, things are going to change. But it's odd the ones that stay fairly static, which is you know this idea of the bear. And even some of the traditions in the in some of our our, our neighbors in, in the Pacific Islands, you know, the people I visited with, the concepts are somewhat similar. They're so similar, but the actors change. So instead of a bear, it's something else. Mm -hmm. So it really, I think it leans on the, the, the closeness of humanity at one point in time in the distant past. 
Um, I, I can't say for sure, but that's just my sense, you know, that we, 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 we all share a, a, a one world together. And I think that that commonality ties us together, even in the deep understanding of, of uh, the phenomenon of the stars. And, I, you know, it's, it's something that's philosophical and very spiritual in nature. And I don't, I don't think, you know, some of the strands of science, you know, find, find it uh, something measurable or, or, you know, they, we can't prove it, but that's the sense I get is, you know, it joins us more than, than divides us. And that's what I really look for is these, these joiners of things and how, how we're, we're so alike, like the brother-in-law, the hated brother-in-law. <laughs> It's very relatable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, we have another question. I think this one is, it's, it's open to any of you. Um, it's how do we decide if and when it's appropriate for somebody like, say, me to tell a story from another culture? So if we're going to do it, the decision-making process of how to do it, and then if we are, if we decide it's okay to do. Now, Carrie, you touched on this a little bit, you know, yeah, the two of your I'm seeing is all about, I'm the astronomer, I will tell you about the stars, mm -hmm. but my colleague here will tell you their story, because it's their story, they've lived it, it's, it's their story to tell, that, that's how it works, so uh, that's why I have a resource list, I'll tell you there is a story, but if you want the story, like for the Mi'kmaq people, we help them recover their skies, we work in partnership with them, and then we help them produce, we funded them producing a bunch of videos where their knowledge keepers are telling about their moons and their, you know, uh, stars. Uh, that's the way it should work. I mean, my colleagues in Australia are the ones, and my colleagues in, in uh, Africa are the ones that told me that what I am is a caretaker. Right. Um, I have a list, I'm a caretaker, and, and that's, the, or, or steward, and that's the best way to look at it. Okay, that's that's useful. Um, definitely you have a big list to to refer to. Uh, it's, Carrie, what's it's difficult because you know we're trying to build trust between yeah. people who look like me and and the, the people who were uh, subjugated to all kinds of horrors by people who look like me, and we're trying to build that back again. This is like I said, right at the outset of the reconciliation process, and uh, yeah. so you know. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of uh, patience, and, and we need to respect these stories. Definitely. Um, Carrie, what's your take on that? I have to admit, my network dropped out for a few seconds there. So we're discussing um, telling multicultural constellations. That's right. Yeah. So you had a little bit, you had a few tips in, in your talk. Is there anything else you want to share about how you decide? Uh, the, biggest, the, the biggest thing I want to reiterate is just to be respectful. Um, mm -hmm. Be, before you tell a story, look at whether there are constraints, because as I mentioned, some stories are not supposed to be told at certain times of year. Um, make sure you're aware of constraints like that. Follow those constraints. Um, if you're able to work with uh, a member of that culture, um, so much the better. Make sure you get the story correct. Let them tell the story recorded. Uh, that might be the best way to go. If nothing else, um, ask for their advice. This is the story as I understand it. Is this correct um, before you tell it? Uh, the more you can involve a local, uh, a, a, a member of that culture from the ground up, the better, I believe. But I, I also think that um, most people are going to be understanding if you are approaching the story from a place of respect, if you make a mistake, everybody's human, we all make mistakes. If you were if you were being trying to be respectful, I think most people would forgive that mistake. Just yeah. learn from it. <laughs> Don't yeah. make the same mistake twice. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, speaking of the stories, Shandon, you're trying to sort out some of the uh, the stories that you've seen written down. Do you think, and I don't know if this is too heavy a question to ask, but do you think that the the way they've been recorded and who did the recording has that? Um, changed the, pers the, the was the perception of how we are looking up at the skies you were talking about how the the sort of cosmology of the salish was a little it was different but a little bit more uh, it's a little deeper than you might get just from looking at a story do you think that that way of viewing the universe may have actually being different than the people who are recording it 
uh, so the the missionaries and the Jesuits and all that. Do you think that that was a perhaps a I don't, I don't even know. It's almost like a geometric leap that they have to make that might have changed uh, how they took the story down and recorded it. Did that yeah. make sense? Sorry, that was a long question. <laughs> it does, yeah. I think, and I think it is it is problematic, and I, and I think that's one of the one of the problems with the previous question is. Um, as an indigenous person hearing stories from other indigenous groups, I, I always, I'm always curious about the, 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 um, a person's thought about that and that uh, indigenous groups, you know, how they feel about that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do know is, you know, our, our, our ancestors were, were very sharing and, and very giving of information. You know, there was always this, this idea of building cooperative relationships with other people and, and always the respect so if somebody asked a question, you know, it was told very honestly, but where things sort of go wrong is, like you said, the interpretation of that, and that's mm -hmm. those often didn't align. And I think that's really the work of a lot of Indigenous scholars in many different fields is really to, to translate those those constructs uh, across uh, a discipline that they might be a bit disjointed. So yeah, so when I'm when I'm reading any text uh, uh, recorded by a non-indigenous, even by an indigenous person, I have to really fully grasp the the context of, of which that was recorded and, and try to interpret it into something that I feel uh, is more fitting to to that situation. So it is problematic, but it's it's quite a unique puzzle. It's it's enjoyable to try to transcribe and relate. But you know, I think. The bottom line is, you know, we were very fortunate, not not of all the ugly things that happened, but we were fortunate that there was a bit that was that was preserved and, and it, it gives us something to work off of. It, it's more of a positive approach to to it. And you know, I, I don't want to downplay any of the the atrocities that happened, but I think folks working in this area, they're, they're well-meaning and and like the um, like was said previously, you know, an honest mistake is very easy to forgive. And I think even for indigenous folks, I think we would hope for that same same reciprocity that, you know, we're going to make mistakes and maybe we'll get upset if somebody telling our stories. But, you know, we we sort of have to break through that on our own, too. So, right. But yeah, yeah, the geometry of stories. That's interesting. The geometry <laughs> of cosmology. Yeah, yeah. I, I get it's that. hard. Well, I mean, when you're trying to explain certain things, you really have to make uh, spatial leaps in your head and it's quite difficult yeah. to do so. Uh, thinking about looking at Leo from above and seeing a lion with a whole bunch of other stuff around it. I had never seen that before. You told me, Charles, that it was going to blow my mind, and it did. Although I will say, I always described the beehive cluster as the hairball that the lion coughed up. So <laughs> I'm glad to see that that's still there. Um, let's see, we have uh, any more questions coming in online? Um, that's great. We had some that uh, I was kind of interested in as well. Um, you were talking, Charles, about some of the telescopic asterisms. So I know one, I know one that looks like a coat hanger, and it's called the coat hanger cluster. And yes. I'm good at finding that one, but that's about it. Do you have any more that uh, maybe people might who are interested in looking at the sky might be able to go out and find? Really quickly, before we go yeah. any further, the first person to record Brocky's cluster was uh, Al Rahman Al Sufi in 936, and he didn't have a telescope. You can see that. Oh, you can, sky. yes, in a good sky, yes. But, yeah, <laughs> but it, it's definitely better if you look with a telescope. Yes, there are um, all kinds of asterisms up there. And as I mentioned, we've got, I'm approaching 1500 on the list right now. Wow. Uh, there are some fabulous ones sites that you can go to that have got um, some real enthusiasts. One is uh, Faint Fuzzies by Robert Zaval, who is in Dusseldorf. Okay. And my favorite is uh, called The Dreaming Child. And it was his friend Rene Merting and uh, Christopher Hay that, that discovered this. And it looks like a child's face slightly turned to the side. Oh yeah, there's some <laughs> really, really creative people that have looked at the sky and then looked at the same ones and said, no, no, that looks like you know, I, I gave you the example of the J.K. Rowling thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's hard to know where to start, but there are all kinds of organizations like the Astronomical League that have asterism viewing programs, and there are all kinds of books out there that you can uh, get, like Demelta Ramaker's book on uh, on uh, asterism. She's from uh, South Africa, so you know, there's the, it, the thing is really 
I found interesting is is uh, getting into the southern hemisphere and seeing some of the stuff that 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 we generally don't worry about because we're up here in the northern hemisphere and there's all kinds of stuff you can see down there that you can't even imagine I, up here. So yeah, you know, if you I, get a chance to go south, take your binoculars. You I was I was gonna say when I went to Australia, um, a friend was showing me what they see as the sword and uh, belt of Orion. It, she called it a saucepan. So the sword is the handle and then the belt and the saucepan. I thought, That's right. well, there you go. It's completely different, but it makes total sense. Uh, actually, we did have a question from Leo who wanted to know, this is a kind of a local question for us here. There is an indigenous sky map at Mississauga City Hall. So Mississauga, for those of you who aren't here in Toronto, is a neighboring city. And uh, Leo was wondering, Charles, if you knew who would maybe informed that. Any I don't idea? know the answer to that, but I, I now am very curious. You'll go and look it, it up. So Perfect. Look it up. OK, Leo. So we'll have the answer for you in a little bit. Um, so I, Shandon, I asked Carrie what the most difficult constellation to show to people was. And she came back and we had some agreement online, by the way. Yes, Canis Minor is ridiculous. Do you have a favorite sky figure that you've run across in your studies, one that you really feel sort of resonates uh, and you kind of get it? Hmm, yeah, that's an interesting question. N not necessarily, you know, I've been sort of reprogramming my brain to see these um, these asterisms from our traditions. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the more recent ones that... Um, well, probably one of the early ones that I that I've sort of um, uh, discerned from the 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 records that we have and some of the stories that align with those is is the, is Orion. It's it's hard for me to unsee what I see now, which is a it's a canoe, and it it makes total sense when you look at it. it it's you know the belt is the is the middle of the canoe, and then the what it be the left shoulder and the right foot is the tips of the canoe. And that describes the story of um of these these five men who are who are friends and are making this very large canoe to go on a little fishing trip, but um they're they're trying to get foiled by uh by uh, the wind who's gonna tip them over and make them drown, but um they all get turned into stars before that happens. So they're all standing around working on this canoe, and that's again viewed from above. So the canoe is not in profile; it's from above. So. That's right. the one I, I see and I've been pointing out to as many people as I can from my home to so that they can reprogram to see what that tradition is. That is a wonderful one. Very appropriate. Charles? The Australians have that too. The all new people, it's the same thing that the three stars is the seat in the boat and, and the sword is the line of fish off the side. That's that's pretty common. That's interesting in it. I, I've seen that too in, in, the, in the folks from the, from the ocean, Pacific Ocean too. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Very interesting. And it, that lends to the idea, you know, that that there might have been visitors from the Pacific that that landed in, in North America way, way early. And um, I've chatted with some of the folks in those islands and they say they have stories of folks that went off on a boat and they're in a storm and they never came back. And they always wondered where they ended up. And so they they some of them hold the belief that some of them ended up ended up in North America. That's interesting. And it actually raises the question of, you know, getting all these stories, we may be able to help piece together some of that history a little more accurately. This is really important so. work, really important work. All right. Well, I think uh, our questions are uh, finishing up. Um, so what I would like to do is offer a chance for any final comments. <laughs> okay. to let go first. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Charles. Go for go it, Charles. Sorry, yeah. I should have thought of that. Go ahead, Charles. <laughs> okay. Um, it's just that I don't think people should be afraid to look up and name things. I mean, it's something that is entirely human, and people have been doing it for years. And one of the things that happened when we created this project is I had various colleagues say, you know. I was at the star party and I said, and we call it the martini glass. Send it to me. <laughs> you know, and, um, yeah, absolutely. I want I want those as well. We we uh we love that stuff. There's some all kinds of really good stuff out there and, and send it in. But I also uh, you know, through partners with astronomers without borders mm -hmm. have been running into uh people who have been able to share their uh cultures. And we like I said, 572 is where we're at now, but there's 7,000 languages. We got a lot of work to do yet. So yeah, yeah it's a living project. If you got stuff, 
don't be afraid to call us and, and we'd love to hear from you. Send it along. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go to you next, Carrie. Any final thoughts? Um, I didn't know very much about the World Asterisms Project until Friday when we did our test. And I have to say, I cannot even imagine taking on a project of that magnitude. It's, it's really impressive the amount of work that you've done. And um, I'm excited to dig into it and, and see what's there and see how it evolves over time. That's so I, I'm, yeah, I also want to say thank you for inviting me to present tonight. It was fun. Good. Thank you very much for coming. And Shandon, any, any final thoughts for us? Yeah, I think one important thought that I'd like to convey is, you know, there's a lot of um, of us Indigenous folks who um, who don't see these stories as fiction or made up. So we didn't look up in the sky and decide, you know, that it was going to be this thing, but that it's actually rooted in the time of creation. So it, it lends to why we might have a, a very common theme, but we interpret it just a bit different is that it's it's it was passed on from a time that was... Uh, when the sort of the animals ruled the earth and then they finally turned it over to us. So a lot of these things are, are deeply rooted in a belief and a spirituality. And I think because of that, because it's very visual, we can see it every night. We can see the manifestation of our thoughts and our beliefs in the sky. I think that, that um, it sort of validates and, but it also reminds us of, of the past, especially, especially I think the, the, um, the Milky Way, which is a really important one, that's like the trail of, of our ancestors or the ones who have passed, they're making their journey on to the next world. So we can see them, we can see them as they make their way. So that's really important. And a lot of people believe that they still hold that to be true, even though we know and understand the discoveries of science, we respect both ways and understand them as both true and valid stories. So that's my final comment. It's a very, very powerful thought and a wonderful way to end. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your lovely Tuesday evening. So to all of you who've joined us online, thank you also for visiting with us tonight and hearing some of these wonderful interpretations of the sky and this power of human ability to imagine things and uh, to see the world reflected in uh, a different place. It's very, very powerful discussion. So as we promised, we will try to put all these resources up on our website so you don't have to remember all the URLs. And uh, hopefully that will also include some email addresses if you have any questions for our speakers tonight. Thanks again for joining us and we wish you all a very pleasant evening. Look up.